I read them all. All eight books. <sighs> Let's get into this video. Hello, my name's Nikki and I make videos on the internet about books. In this particular video, I'm going to be talking about the fact that I did in fact read all eight Bridgerton books, the accompanying second epilogue that is now on the back of the new editions of the Bridgerton novels, which before was in this compendium called Bridgerton Happily Ever After, and I watched season two of the series. So I am what you might say is an expert on Bridgerton at this point. So what is Bridgerton, in case you haven't seen the internet in a couple of years? Bridgerton is a historical romance set in the universe created by Julia Quinn, and each of the novels involves one of the Bridgerton siblings because Violet and Edmund Bridgerton decided that it would be a good idea to have eight children. Each one has their own respective romance and their own respective, you know, stuff that goes along and their own arc and that's what each of the books are and that's what the series as a whole focuses on. Just to start off in a more positive light, I'm gonna just talk about what I liked about the series. I think that the series in general is fun. It is light. As long as you don't take it too seriously, I'll get into that when I get into the bad of why you shouldn't take it so seriously. I would say that the strongest thing that this book has are its supporting cast. And I mean in the oddest sense. So we have our Lady Danbury who is excellent in the books. We have our Violet Bridgerton who is excellent in the books. But I would argue that the siblings are strongest when they are not the main character of their story and they are just so fun to be around when they are not the main character. Once they're the main character they're boring but when they are not the main character, chef's kiss. And now onto the bad, I will have to admit, when I said not to take it too seriously, I mean in the way that Julia Quinn writes historical romance, and remember these books were published 20 years ago, she writes them very much so that they're true to the time, and so the main male protagonist often showcase this very misogynistic standpoint when it comes to marriage and matrimony and just like, you know, relationships as a whole. You know, that sort of like, you are my wife, therefore my property. Property. If you're not into that, it's probably not for you if you can't stand it. I personally just looked past it and just decided like, ugh, that will just take off a star. But all the books in general have it. There's no one book, even my favorites, they all have this. It's an overarching theme. You just have to see what floats your boat and if you can stand to read it. I personally am of the mind of you are catering to modern sensibilities. There's no reason to have those sorts of male protagonists, especially when they're just not attractive. It's not attractive to have a male protagonist like that. I think it can be present in the other characters, but just not our male protagonist, but that's just me. Maybe that's why I'm not a historical romance author. I don't know. And the other thing that I didn't particularly like, which is weird because this is a historical romance, is a romance aspect of it. I would say that it didn't always land. I didn't find the sex scenes consistent throughout the series there was a lot of variation and there's a lot of you know different things if like you know different strokes for different folks so maybe you'll find what you're into but there were various scenes and intimacies that were just not for me including the virgin sex trope it's just not for me it doesn't float my boat i don't particularly like it even though like obviously these are historical romance these are ladies so like whatever not the point just so you know that occurs here and if you don't like that then like this series just isn't for you it's in all of the books except one so now let's get into the separate books and what i thought about each one i'm going to preface this section by saying these are romance books and in order to be called a romance book and to be sold as a romance you must have a happily ever after if it doesn't have a happily ever after it's not a romance it is a fiction novel with like romantic overtones but it's not a romance so it is not a spoiler for me to say that everyone in these books ends up together at the end so just like putting that out there don't kill me because i said like they end up together at the end so we're gonna start with the first book of the series and that would have to be the duke and i and this is the tv tie-in version because i bought this book literally like six months ago before i even started this vendetta i had i really liked the characters and i'd already seen season one by the time i read this instead of discovering if i like it it's more just like oh i'm reading it to see the differences if i like it and comparing it to the show 
I think that's inevitable if you ever try to read something that you've already seen the series of. I would say that the CV series is way more faithful to this book compared to book two and season two. Just have that in mind. If you read this, you're basically just getting the series again, but there is a lot more context to Simon and Daphne's relationship. In case you don't know and you haven't seen the series, this book is about Daphne and Simon. Daphne is the fourth oldest Bridgerton. Something that's like weird and they like whistle down talks about a lot in these books is the fact that each of the Bridgertons are named by alphabetical order, I guess, because there were so many. But either way, Daphne is the fourth child and she's actually already in her second season. This is different from the series. She is kind of a wallflower. No one really pays attention to her because she's just a guy's gal. People like her. She's very much into her masculinity, I guess but like she's still very feminine. That's not the point. The point is that basically like guys don't take her seriously because she's too chill and they think she's just like, you know, one of the guys, even though like she doesn't have guy friends. That's not the point here. The point is that when the Duke of Hastings comes in for the season, mostly to settle his father's affairs, he ends up approaching her to concoct this sort of plan so that they can pretend that they're dating so that people will leave him alone, the mamas of the ton, and she will get the attention of male suitors. They become like really good friends and then lovers, but then like both of them, mostly him, like definitely 95% him, has like a lot of like emotional baggage daddy issues that he has to work through in order for them to have their happy ending. Unfortunately, the only way I can talk about this is in comparison to the series and the TV adaptation. I obviously was already imagining these two actors as Simon and Daphne because also he's like so attractive and she is too, but like he's so good looking. Anyways, that's not the point. The point is I did like the romance and how it evolved in the book compared to the series. I feel like since the series focuses on other characters like the queen, like Eloise, like Penelope, you don't see the romance as much and I feel like there was a lot more connection and a lot more witty banter. I could feel them falling in love for each other in the book versus in the series other than like smoldering looks that they give each other throughout the TV show but I will say that the sex scenes in this one like didn't hit it for me they were like pretty like tame I don't know if it was just that the TV series was like a lot more you know raunchy or what and maybe that's what's in my mind but it just wasn't that much for me the thing that happens that like is very controversial I would argue that it's like dealt with a little bit better in the book but either way it's not something I like to see in a romance book it gave me the ick and it obviously just colored my entire review of this so I ended up reading this book a three out of five stars. Okay, and now let's go on to book two. This is Kate and Anthony's story, The Viscount Who Loved Me. This is the most recent season that's been adapted. It is arguably before even the season came out. This is arguably fans' favorite book of the series, this one, or Benedict's, which is book three. And I understand this was such an unexpected treat. I didn't think I would like it so much, but the relationship between these two characters, like, oh, it was so good. Anyways, what is this about? This is about Anthony Anthony, who finally decides that it's time for him to find a wife, but his only stipulation is that he finds someone that he can't fall in love with. So he's basically just looking for someone that's beautiful, someone that like might be a little bit smart and someone he can just get along with, but no one that he could ever have real feelings for. And we have Kate, who is the eldest of the Sheffield sisters, and she is actually Mary's stepdaughter and Edwina's half-sister, and she is basically just looking to get her sister married. She has really no interest in getting married. It's never been something that she she has envisioned for herself but since her sister is the diamond of the season and their family has come into hard times it is imperative that one of them get married at least this season even though everyone thinks it's gonna be Edwina. When Edwina is named the diamond of the season and I do have to just like give a little preface here in the books there's no queen character there's no grand thing where like the queen names the diamond it's just basically like the prettiest girl in the season is like the person that's named the diamond that's that's how it works in the books. Anthony starts pursuing Edwina because she is the diamond and the most sought after lady of the ton and Mary does not believe that a reformed rake could ever make a good husband. So that's basically where the antagonism starts and it builds up to a romance. This one has a forced marriage trope so it is very different from the series and how they adapted it but I really enjoyed this when I read it. There are some tones of just like uncomfortableness but it was really rewarding to read Anthony's struggles and how he overcame his emotional baggage. All of these guys have emotional baggage. Another daddy issues 
emotional baggage in this book. I liked it. It was a five out of five stars for me. The third book, and the one that I mentioned is the second most popular of the series, is an offer from a gentleman, and this is Benedict and Sophie's story. This is a Cinderella retelling, and it's the only retelling in this series, and I had no expectations going into this. I liked Benedict a lot from the first two books because he's very funny and lighthearted, but I felt like he had more than meets the eye, like a Transformer. Transformers! <laughs> And I was right. This book is about Sophie, who is the bastard daughter of an Earl, the Cinderella of the story. And one day she finally makes it to the Bridgerton ball, that's a masquerade ball, against her stepmother's wishes. Not that her stepmother knows, but she goes there secretly. And there she meets Benedict and they have a sort of like lightning strike, love at first sight sort of thing. But he never learns her name and he never actually sees her face completely. This book then does a time jump three years later where she has been kicked out of the home that she was in with the stepmother and she ends up by mysterious circumstances running into Benedict again but he doesn't recognize her from that night he just is trying to help her because of another reason when he finds her in a compromising and uncomfortable position and so after that he also is falling in love with her and he's always held out hope that this mysterious woman would come back and he would find her again and marry her but he never found her and so by the time he meets so Sophie, he's just so enthralled but she right now is a ladies maid so she doesn't have the status to be with him so it causes a lot of drama and conflict and the book is super spicy because there's like different expectations since she's not a lady in the official sense of the term I don't know I really liked it Benedict was so annoying at times in this book but overall he was just so fun he made me laugh so much all of these green tabs are that he made me laugh and the book like these these scenes were very very spicy and very very like ooh, my heart's fluttering i really liked it and i would recommend it but i really didn't expect much from this book i give it a four out of five stars now the fourth book of the series and uh, this is a lot of people's most anticipated book but then later most disappointing and it was one of the most disappointing books for me. It is Romancing Mr. Bridgerton, and this is Penelope and Colin's story. A moment for our girl after this season. Colin's such a piece of shit. Colin is the biggest transgressor of I loved you in the other books, but when you got to your own book, I could not stand you. Let me tell you what this book is about, and then I will tell you why I think it is such a disappointing read. So this is about Penelope, and she's been Eloise's best friend for years. She is by this point a spinster. She has a big secret that she's keeping from everyone. She very much always wanted to find love and be loved, but she was a wallflower because she had her first season when she still wasn't ready and not beautiful conventionally. By the way, that is a trend throughout all of these books. All of the main love interests, none of them are beautiful. None of them take your breath away. It's only our main love interest that gets them and sees their beauty. It's so annoying. But her, she frustrated me because like her big glow up had to do with her losing weight and then later on like he just kind of Ugh, this book is so frustrating to me. Like I get angry even thinking about it. Penelope's been in love with Colin for years. This takes place around 10-ish years after the Viscount Who Loved Me. So a lot of time has passed. She's a spinster at this point. She never found love and she's kind of resigned to this with her secrets and everything like that. And so Colin finally comes back after traveling for some time and when he comes back he finally starts seeing Penelope in a different light. This book ranks super low in this list because it was disappointing to see how they dealt with Penelope's character. You would think by this point she would be a bit less meek. And Colin is very patronizing. Even though he has not shown one ounce of interest, he has hurt her feelings countless times throughout this series. He thinks he has the right to go boss her around, tell her what to do, and impose his wishes on her. And that was just not it. Not romantic at all. It totally ruined Colin for me as a main character and Penelope as well because I loved Penelope. I was rooting for her but she really just fell flat. I think Penelope would have had justice if she ended up with someone else. I think it would have been so much better if she had ended up with someone that wasn't Colin Bridgerton. I think if she maybe ended up with like a prince or something but someone else that kind of valued her from the beginning rather than like being like oh well like I guess I like you. I also felt like in this book we finally get that big reveal of Penelope's secret 
and it was dealt in the most anticlimactic way I have ever seen such a big secret dealt. It really was a total disappointment and this right now ranks at the bottom of my list. I think I gave it like a 2.5 stars. <sighs> disappointing and we continue with the disappointment because this book the fifth book is this the fifth book yes this is the fifth book this was a disappointment to sir philip with love is eloise's love story and eloise is the most frustrating character ever i don't like her i think she's super this is about Eloise and Sir Philip, and Eloise starts corresponding with this young widower who widowed from her cousin, Marina, Marina Crane? Yeah, Marina. That she, they ended up taking her story and they adapted it way earlier, but in the book, that cousin does not come out until she's dead. Because of their correspondence, Sir Philip ends up offering her a hand in marriage. By this point, Eloise is 26, but she's already turned down countless offers of marriage. She just didn't want to get married. She just didn't see any of the guys that proposed to her as a potential suitor. After Penelope gets married and she realizes that her best friend that she always thought would be there for her, not because she wanted to be there for her, even though I'm sure Penelope wanted to be there for her, but because she couldn't didn't have a choice because no one's gonna like propose her she's like oh my god now i'm gonna end up alone by myself and i need to figure it out so she i don't want to get into spoilers because it's like maybe you want to read this book and be disappointed yourself but either way i found that eloise was super mature eloise in this book had a or julia quinn i guess had this habit of telling us how eloise was so practical and eloise herself saying she's so practical but she's the most impulsive person ever and the romance of this book was absolutely infuriating and oh it's such a turn off basically sir philip is just looking for someone to mother his children he has no interest in finding love or anything like that he's just like i need someone to mommy my children so that i can go play outside with my plants that's it and of course later on they end up falling in love with each other but it was like ugh. And that is why it is at the bottom of this list. So after all of that disappointment, I went into When He Was Wicked, which is Francesca and Michael's story, with very low expectations. I just wanted to get through this series by this point because I'd heard other books in the series were better. I had literally heard nothing about this, and I have to admit that I'm pretty lukewarm about it. This is about Francesca, and her love story is with Michael, who is the best friend of her late husband, like her husband dies. This book takes place three years after the husband is dead and Michael who knew he was in love with her like since before his friend died it's basically them trying to navigate those feelings and that attraction and what they feel for each other this book out of all of them has the best spicy scenes because Francesca's not a virgin so you don't have to deal with all that virgin sex and the, like they're like ugh. and I really liked Michael I would say that he was a lot more open-minded than the other love interest he was a lot cooler and I just enjoyed his presence what I didn't like about this book was Francesca she was annoying she was very wishy-washy she couldn't make up her mind Mind, and it totally ruined the romance of it. I just did not like it, but the sexy scenes in this book make up for it. So this ended up getting like a three stars out of five for me. I had to take like a little bit of a breather before I get into the next book because the shift on how much I like the series completely changed with this book because it was just so good. And this is, it's in his kiss, and this is Hyacinth and Gareth's story. And let me tell you, this is fantastic. This book is Hyacinth's story. And if you've read up to this point, you've already seen Hyacinth playing a large role, especially in the last three books as a side character, much like Lady Danbury and Violet Bridgerton. And I think out of all of them, this was the one that got it most right of having the Bridgerton main character be so likable because she's just so unapologetically herself. She is so wild, so free, so curious, and it's just very relatable. I think she's like probably the most modern out of all the ladies in these books. She ends up meeting Gareth, who is the inheritor of the St. Clair name after his older brother dies. He is the second son, and he and his father do not get along for reasons I will leave unknown. But after his brother dies, he ends up being given by his brother's widow the diary of his late brother. The diary contains the information from his Italian grandmother, 
that he cannot translate himself because he doesn't speak Italian. Hyacinth ends up speaking Italian and after unforeseen circumstances, including the meddling of Lady Danbury, she ends up agreeing to translate these diaries for him and through the translation of the diary, there is a secret that she is dead set on helping him unfold. It starts both a romance and a mystery and because of that, I feel like this book has just the most complete plot line out of all of them. I will say, even though I do like this book so much, maybe one might not like it as much if they hadn't read the other books in the series and seen Hyacinth, but I do feel like this out of all of them has the most complete plot, the most likable male protagonist, the most likable female protagonist, and it has all of those things I liked about the Bridgerton series, which is the spicy scenes are quite spicy and very fun, and seeing Hyacinth feeling bested by someone and getting frustrated is very fun to see because Hyacinth is usually the one that always gets the last word. It is also so fun to see Lady Danbury and Violet Bridgerton having such a huge role because Gareth is Lady Danbury's grandson and he's very much devoted to her which is also so sweet to see someone devoted to their grandparent in such a way. And yeah, like I have no complaints on this. This is a 5 out of 5 stars. I could see myself picking this book up so many times. It is just, it makes me feel very complete. And then, finally, we're on the last book of the series, and it's, it didn't end on a good note, unfortunately. <laughs> book number eight in the series, it is Gregory's story, Gregory and Lucy's story, and let me tell you, I do not like Gregory. I think that they should have stopped at Hyacinth. This book was totally unnecessary. Gregory is such a bore. Like, I mean it in, like, boring and boreish. Like, the guy is a total, like... So this book is about Gregory and he ends up finally one day he decides like it's time for me to find a wife and the first party he goes to he sees this beautiful woman called Hermione Watson and he's like that's going to be my wife but Hermione is in love with another person and so Lucy her best friend doesn't approve of that person and Lucy's kind of like been very overshadowed and it's very annoying because throughout the entire book all anyone would talk about is the fact that Lucy is not as pretty as Hermione and like in all of the Bridgerton books, you really do see this overarching theme of like, oh, she was like plain, but only I could see her beauty, blah, blah, blah. But this one really hit a little bit too much. It was annoying. I wanted to see at least once like the diamond of the season being like pursued and like them having to use their rakish charms. No, I didn't get that through this series. And I'm getting frustrated mostly because how could you go from this to this? Oh. Lucy ends up falling in love with Gregory while she's helping her best friend try to fall in love with Gregory and the stuff happens and she but she's also engaged to someone else so it's like a big mess it's like a not even a love triangle it is a love pentagon at this point this one really got like the lowest remarks from me I think it was just like a bad book and also I think maybe I would have liked it a bit more if Gregory had more of a role in the last couple of books but he only has like a brief moment in this book and even then it's not enough compared to like what Hyacinth had. He was just very unlikable, very, what's the word, superficial. The book just didn't land for me and I don't think it'll land for everyone. This one honestly got like a one star and it was my least favorite so there you go. My final ranking is on the screen right now. I feel like if you watch this video completely you would have probably think I would have put Romancing Mr. Bridges and Sir Philip at the end but no, that book was such a waste of time, this last book. Ugh. With that, let's get into what I thought of season two in general and my concluding thoughts on this video. Season two, I actually really enjoyed it. I would recommend that if you ever want to read the books and watch the series, there's really no need to read book one of this series because it is so faithful to the original book, but you can definitely read book two of the series and get a completely different story. I was disappointed somewhat with some of the main scenes from the book, like especially the one in the thunderstorm getting cut because I think it really showed a lot of compassion from Anthony's part and it was when I really fell in love with him. But I will say that they did an amazing job with the slow burn. I would argue that it is one of the best slow burns I've ever seen in any sort of media. It left me at the edge of my seat the entire time. I felt the tension. I was enthralled. That actor, he's amazing. I forgot his name. And she, amazing. And all of them, amazing. I would say the one thing that I didn't like too much was how they changed Edwina's character a bit. I would have liked to see her have her own happy ending. But 
it's it's okay with the subplots because obviously the books just focus on the romance there's none of those subplots especially with Eloise and Penelope I am team Penelope here Eloise was frustrating in the first season and in the second season I thought that maybe the series would redeem her a bit that I would like her a bit more but honestly Eloise is very pretentious she doesn't look outside herself and she also does not even think about what her friend might be going through I understand that Penelope is not perfect because she has her own flaws and her own things she must work through. I also agree with this in the books. Eloise is so self-absorbed that she doesn't ever realize that her friend doesn't want to be in this wallflower spinster position that she never gets married. It's because like she doesn't have the confidence or like no one approaches her for that but she would definitely have that if she could and Eloise who just like brushes off romance and balls and everything when Penelope would love that and not see that like maybe that would hurt Penelope. I don't know. It, it was really frustrating for me. I will say that I do like the whistle down plot change because as I mentioned the big drama that happens in the fourth book it is so anticlimactic that I really like how they're handling it in the series and I think it's really fun to see the change and also it was what I wanted to see from Penelope's book and you you don't get that at all like you get very little of the stories dedicated to this like huge conspiracy that she's had as like this like secret identity for so long it's so little of it and it's really disappointing so I'm really excited that they've incorporated it more and I really like the Queen's plot line and arc in this and how she's a character because she's not a character in the books I think in the first season she was a bit frustrating but in the second season I really liked her and I liked her character dynamics and I like how she's so conniving and manipulative and she'll like get what she wants. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a stan of the queen. And on that note, I will also just mention that I love Lady Danbury and Violet Bridgerton. I think that they did excellent jobs this season with their characters and Lady Danbury isn't as present in the first couple of books, but she's honestly great and I love how they made her a more prevalent character in this season because she's a favorite. Violet Bridgerton, like her storyline and seeing everything in the flashbacks, that was great. So yeah. I honestly really approved of this season's interpretation. I think it's going to be interesting going forward. I was heartbroken for Penelope. Colin's such a dick. From what I've read online, they're going to do Penelope and Colin's story arc. They're changing it a bit. I'm very interested how they're going to handle Eloise's arc, if she's still going to end up with Sir Philip Crane or what. But anyways, my final thoughts on this series is I've been dabbling in historical romance since I've read this series and since Bridgerton because I do like it and I will say that these aren't the best historical romance books I would recommend just like picking and choosing there's no need to read these in order like I did there's a lot of other authors that I think are better but I'm definitely still in the beginning of my journey so if you ever want a historical romance review and recommendation video let me know but on that note I'll let you go because I've been talking for way too long and I need to get some water so Bye.